Hello and welcome to Dateline London. While Israel undoubtedly has the firepower to win the military battle against Hamas, has it lost the battle for international support? And does that matter? Russia appears unimpressed with further Western sanctions and, in an otherwise grim news week, does the prospect of a driverless car cheer you up? Well, my guests today are Jonathan Sakodoti of the Israel-based I24 News Channel, Mustafa Kakuti of Gulf News, who formerly worked for the United Nations Palestine, Palestinian Refugee Agency, Stephanie Baker of Bloomberg Markets, and Ian Burrell of the Mail on Sunday. Good to see you all. Well, in the 1960s and 1970s, Israel had the reputation in many Western countries as a plucky nation of settlers who made the desert and democracy bloom in hostile soil, attracting Jewish and many non-Jewish volunteers from around the world to work on kibbutzes. Now, with nightly news reports showing hundreds upon hundreds of dead Palestinian civilians, including many women and children in Gaza, how far is Israel's image now one of a regional bully? How far is this an excuse for anti-Semitism? And how far will it result in new pressures for a real Palestinian state? Jonathan, first of all, do you accept that the way in which people around the world are reacting to what's going on in Gaza has been very profoundly damaging to the way Israel is seen around the world? Israelis that I speak to often feel that when they're engaged in military activity in Gaza especially, there is a reaction across the world which often criticizes them for the images that are seen on the televisions of the casualties in Gaza. However, I think that this time round, in this particular operation, it's actually been the case that many world leaders have actually stood behind Israel's right to defend itself against what is essentially a jihadi threat coming out of Gaza. And that's a conflict that I think is being played out all over the world, especially in the Middle East. Maybe a greater appreciation of that fact that Hamas represents really a local chapter of the Muslim Brotherhood, which Egypt is now against. Most of the Middle East backed the Egyptian ceasefire proposal that Hamas rejected and Israel accepted. And there seems to be this growing realization among the leadership of the world that Israel may actually have a justified case here. But in terms of uh, people around the world, uh, people who have expressed opinions and been polled, for example, there's one interesting one about uh, who are considered the world's troublemakers. And Iran and North Korea are at the bottom of the list, and Israel now comes very near the bottom of the list as a, as a serious troublemaker. Now, whatever the official line is from many governments, that's the way many people, particularly in Europe, feel. Well, there's an old saying in Israel that Israel isn't part of the problem, it's part of the solution. And I think that's generally the mood in Israel, that they are on the front line of this battle against jihadis. And when we hear what Israel's fighting against at the moment, not just the terror rockets that came out of Gaza, uh, put there by Iran, for example, uh, quite powerful rockets this time around, with quite a, a high range that can reach even as far as Haifa in the north of Israel. But Israel's also discovered during this engagement that there are terror tunnels underneath the border going into and near Israeli villages and kibbutzim. And I think really what they're hoping is that the world will think how it would be if they looked out into their own gardens and their own homes and imagined jihadis coming out of a tunnel within their own village, kidnapping children, killing families, as we saw them do with the Fogel family in the West Bank not that long ago. And we've seen inside these tunnels from the, the information revealed that there's chloroform, there's anesthetic in there for people that they would kidnap and then spirit away in the tunnels. And now we've seen it happen with, a te uh, with the terrorist capture, potentially, of one Israeli soldier, which will be putting great fear into Israel. M Mustafa, I mean, you, you worked with the UN in helping Palestinian refugees in dire situations very often. Um, do, you, do you accept that Hamas does not do the Palestinian cause any favours by the use of rockets and by some of the activities that, that some of their supporters engage in? Well, I mean, according to the information available, uh, Palestinians in general, the vast majority of Palestinians inside Gaza, do not necessarily support Hamas. Hamas is a group, Muslim-inclined group and all that, but the current war, it's not as Jonathan suggested, a, a, a war against jihadis. I mean, you have, what, a couple of thousand of Hamas members in Gaza, but the people who are killed are children, women, 75%, according to the United Nations, are civilian, uh, civilian out of the total 1,640 now Palestinian uh, uh, killed in this war. So it's not really a war. It's the war is uh, is, is the wrong, wrong uh, word to describe what's happening uh, in Gaza. Do you, do you this think is an aggression against mm -hmm. uh, uh, any kind of solution, if you like, for the Palestinian problem. You cannot solve the Palestinian problem in this world. Now, Netanyahu government find itself in a trap of its own making. What is the trap? A trap, because they want out. They don't know how to get out. 
and there is no way to move forward. Look, this is a war. Israel cannot win, and a war the Palestinians cannot lose, because the Palestinians in Gaza are also in a trap. They have nowhere else to go. Now Israel has decided to extend the buffer zone to three, four kilometers around the Strip, which make the territory 20% less than its original uh, size. The, in this strip, you have 1,800,000 people live in it. Now they have a smaller geographic area to live in. You have 4,500 people in one square meter, which is the largest, the most dense population on Earth. It isn't. This is going to be a lot more. Well, how do you, because you, you were one of the volunteers in a kibbutz. Yeah, long, long I went to ago. a kibbutz in 1982 on the Golan Heights and a uh, day before I got there the invasion of Lebanon started. And in a way I think for people of my generation, we were the generation which was brought up by in the post-war era and we had this rather idealised vision of the pioneering country. And I think the tragedy that began in 1982 and which has been played out so, so extremely now is seeing this extraordinarily disproportionate response by Israel, which is so negative in trying to find a solution. And I think the tragedy is, yes, of course, Israel has a right to defend itself. And Israel is still a democracy and it's a very vibrant country. But this is so disproportionate committing these atrocities day after day after day but it's also so self-defeating because all they're doing is shoring up Hamas. Hamas was a force. A lot of the tunnels had been closed down by Egypt uh, under Sisi. Hamas was a force which was much much weaker and was struggling and all Israel has done is strengthen a force which was weaker and and alienate what global opinion and alienate Arabic opinion and put off a solution and I think that's the real tragedy of this. Stephanie? Yeah, I mean, this is the deadliest, most prolonged war in Gaza since Israel withdrew in 2005. And, you know, it, it's been a lesson in humility for John Kerry, Secretary of State, who, you know, over the past 18 months in his role has thrown himself into crisis after crisis um, and achieved very little in the way of breakthrough, um, except for maybe the Syria chemical weapons accord. Um, you know, he, he made 100 phone calls trying to broker this ceasefire, and it's very hard to see how... Uh, that can resume, or peace talks can resume, given the capturing of this uh, Israeli soldier, or the potential capturing of this Israeli soldier. Um, you know, I think this time the conflict in Gaza is different than the, the one in 2009 or 2012, and I think it's because the region has changed and the regional power brokers have changed. Egypt, um, you know, has, uh, you know, is loath to be seen to be helping Hamas because of its connections with the Muslim Brotherhood. Qatar, which um, hosts the Hamas leader Khalid Mashal, has undergone a leadership change of its own. It has a new young emir, um, and it, you know it's the previous leadership in Qatar, which punched above its weight in terms of mediating in regional conflicts. That's now changed, and you know it's really hard to see how how this is going to play out. I'm, I'm struck l looking at the way Israel has conducted itself officially over the past week or two uh, by something that Abba Iban. The Israeli statesman said many years ago about the Palestinians, surely this applies to Israel now, that you never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Hamas was weakened, as uh, Ian has rightly said, very, very weakened. It has very few Arab friends among Arab governments. There was a chance to make peace with a unified Palestinian leadership, and Israel has blown it. I think that's quite a harsh uh, suggestion that Israel blew this. I think certainly, um, as Stephanie said, John Kerry's record in making peace in the Middle East hasn't been exemplary, to say the least. But I think also if we look at uh, picking apart some of what we've just heard now, uh, Hamas uh, is severely weakened now. Its enormous weapons supply from Iran has been somewhat depleted during this operation. But it was and weakened politically anyway. Well, I mean, that's why it joined it was, up with, uh, it was, with Fatah. It was, it was not. It was not. And defeated by Sisi. It was not weakened enough to stop the thousands of rockets that still entered into Israel. And I think that the reason that people sometimes here feel that there is some sort of disproportionality about what's going on now is that really most of those attacks on Israel aren't reported because they don't result in deaths. Uh, the same Whereas way, we because, see pictures of dead of Palestinian course. children. But the, the reason for that is that Israel has spent millions investing in weapons defense systems and as soon as they've mastered defending against threats like that they encounter new threats as has always been the case with Islamist and jihadi opponents of Israel. As soon as one method that they use is mastered they develop another and these terror tunnels, the Telegraph the other day saying that they were developed in conjunction Junction with North Korea, for example, these sorts of things are a severe threat to Israel. To think that jihadis could be literally coming out of tunnels in people's villages, homes, and gardens, and kidnapping and slaughtering people.
people that the plan that they think and they have you, uncovered but, uh, was... But hold on, we're not talking about moral equivalence here. We're also talking about, uh, you know, uh, Israeli soldiers blowing up Palestinian homes. That's pretty awful too. But again, it? I think that what we're seeing on the news here is very different from what we're seeing on Israeli news, where they cover things in a lot more detail, understandably. And I think that the news reporting here, it's slowly coming out now, is somewhat influenced by the inability of journalists in Gaza to be able to speak freely. We've seen now a Russia Today journalist kicked out of Gaza for mentioning and showing a picture on Twitter of where rocket launchers were. We've seen Washington Post journalists, uh, we've seen uh, Wall Street Journal journalists, we've seen French newspaper Liberation, all of them. Uh, whenever the journalists who are embedded in Gaza have criticized right. or shown Hamas fighters, they've been intimidated, said that their families have been threatened okay. and kicked out of Gaza. Understand. That's why people here don't understand the proportionality of this. So, they don't so, see so the if other they side. knew more about it, that if they knew sure. more about, about it, they changed their the views. The story but, about the thousands of rockets fired at Israel and the point about jihadis and all that, that's a very excellent spin on the side of the Israeli spokesman. They all say the same song. They sing the same song. They talk about that. These are primitive rockets. They're not. They're they Iranian cannot, Fajr 5 rockets they, that have they, the capacity to reach With the Fajr. Iron Dome, which the Americans supplied Israel, it protects Israel out of the thousand of rockets. How many rockets fell, hit targets? Well, Israel can't how apologize many, for how its many Israelis superior have been hurt strategy for its civilians. That's ludicrous. And and anyhow, sure. the aggression, Israeli aggression against the Palestinian people, I'm not saying against Hamas, the reason for that is not the rockets at all. It started differently. Five years ago, the same similar aggression was not the rocket. Fifteen years ago, other, another aggression, there were no rockets. So the rockets point is really meaningless. The rockets have been launched That's since one, the Israeli the other point from Gaza. Is, let me finish. Let him finish. Just one more, one more uh, uh, point. The, the other side of things, this is Netanyahu war. He wants to score some points for internal political uh, uh, gains. Look, now public opinion in the world, among Jews, by the way, Netanyahu policy is hurting Jews everywhere in the world. I wanted to bring, bring you into that because there, there has been, you know, some fairly disgraceful anti-Semitic things said yeah. in Western European countries as a result of this. And do you think there's a, I mean, do you see that as a direct consequence? And do you see that as something particularly nasty now in Western Europe? Or will it just fade when this particular crisis goes away? I think there is an issue, certainly, that because of what's happened, there has been a rise in anti-Semitism. It's hard to deny that. But I think that can be a distraction from the core issue. And the core issue is that Israel is acting in this extraordinarily disproportionate manner. Uh, there were rocket attacks, and Israel does have a right to defend itself, but the number of rocket attacks has increased hugely since the attack started, since Israel responded. All Israel has done is, is strengthen their enemies, the most militant forces in Gaza. They've uh, uh, terrorizing uh, a group of people who are already imprisoned in an area where they can't flee from. And uh, the worst thing of all is the fact that a solution is so much further away. And with every day that Israel stays there, with every day that they continue to slaughter people, they're making that solution harder for themselves. So it's totally self-defeating. And that's, to me, the real tragedy. Let's it's self-defeating for Israel. Let's move on, the I'm victim of this war is the peace solution for the Palestinian problem. OK, let's move on, because Russia's answer to the prospect of even more Western sanctions is, in short, not bothered. But if the changes in Russia and China over the past 30 years have taught us anything, surely there is a clear lesson in how economics drives politics, and an economic mess produces political instability. Is Vladimir Putin, Putin risking Russia's economic future by his actions in Ukraine? Do you think, I mean, do you think he would, really does care about economic sanctions, or do you think that's just uh, uh, the hope of the West? Um, I think he does care. The question is, will the sanctions actually change his behavior? And I think the clear answer is no. Um, he, you know, he's in a fight for political survival within Russia. He's fanned the flames of Russian nationalism. Um, and there's no face-saving way for him to, to climb down. He has huge uh, public support as a result of his actions in, in Crimea and uh, Ukraine. Um, you know, I think he, his statements this week were essentially, we don't care. You know, this will give us an opportunity to develop um, industries that we have not developed because of the open economy. This will give us another opportunity to forge closer relations with China. Um, and I think that's somewhat sh short sighted, very short sighted, because, you know, Russian companies have gotten used to raising billions uh, of dollars uh, in Western capital markets. I mean, you know, we reported this week that. 
four state-controlled banks in Russia have $15 billion worth of bonds maturing in the next three years, denominated in euros, dollars, and Swiss francs. And they're going to have a hard time repaying that debt unless they can access Western capital markets. Um, so, you know, I think it's a real, the, the sanctions, you know, let's remember the sanctions don't target Russian oil exports, so uh, there's still further that the West can go on Although this. Although there's a degree of self-harm coming up, but, well, anyway, but because, uh, you know, it, once you start targeting the export of energy, you're also targeting the customers in a way, aren't exactly. you? Exactly. Which is Western Europe. Right, and, and, and Germany does not want that. But, you know, I think that the sanctions are a real turning point. You have diplomats in Washington and Brussels trying to say this is not a new Cold War, but it really looks like one from the outset. It brings to an end 25 years of, you know, the West bringing Russia into the fold, bringing it, integrating Russia, Russia's economy into the West. Um, and it's very hard to see, you know, with Putin still in control, and it looks like he'll be, be there for the foreseeable future, mm -hmm. digging his heels <laughs> in, longer. <laughs> how, how this is going to, um, you know, how diplomatic relations will uh, warm up again. And you, now, you've been reporting from, from, from Ukraine. How, how, how do you see it? And do you, I mean, there is another way of looking at it, which is, you know, for 200 years, the enigma of Russia has been how European are they? And it's been an enigma that many Russians have also faced. And perhaps the answer is not very. I think the trouble is that uh, the West has been very slow to realise the true nature of the Putin regime. Uh, he's basically been a pretty thuggish gangster president from the start. And uh, when he seized Crimea, the first annexation in Europe uh, since 1945, very little was done about it. The mildest slap on the wrist uh, resulted. And that just encouraged them, I think. And, the, and um, it was the worst possible response. Now there are slightly stronger sanctions, but even these are pretty mild. And the long term, the effects won't be felt for a, for a while. Um, and still, they haven't targeted some of the key people. Uh, Abramovich and Usmanov are still not targeted as they should be, and as some of the uh, leading Russian dissidents, the very few remaining, uh, have suggested. Um, and there's still a lot more that could be done. And the trouble is that the reaction has been typically Putin-esque, which is that he's ramped up the support for the militants since the shooting down of the airliner. And uh, we now have this situation where there is, you know, close to full-scale war going on there, with Donetsk being ripped apart by it, with very obvious Russian supply, Russian uh, people involved in it, uh, Russian targeting it. And um, it's very hard to see where we go from this, yet still we're allowing France to sell naval warships, still we're not targeting some of the key oligarchs, still we're not targeting the people, that, the uh, sectors that would hurt now. And uh, this isn't really going to work, I don't think, at the moment. When you're up against someone like Putin, if you're going to enter the road of sanctions, you've got to do them effectively and you've got to do them hard. But unfortunately, Europe is, uh, although they have in, possibly imposed slightly stronger sanctions than America, Europe remains so divided that they're, they're not fit at the moment to, to respond to a threat like this. I think Europeans were caught off guard by Putin himself when he went into uh, East Ukraine and, and uh, getting back the Crimea. The, the, uh, it is a very complicated issue based on trade and economic, and I find it extremely difficult for Europe to apply sanc sanction 100%, because it's self-hurting, that's one thing. The other, uh, the other thing, I've just read, in fact, before I came here, that now the Russians have stopped importing Polish apple, which, which is worth one, one billion euros uh, a year. This is not a lot in, in GDP terms. But it represents about one percent of of uh, GDP. It's a lot, presumably for some Polish farmers. Absolutely. And if we go down this route, trade war, uh, a lot of people will be hurt in Europe before they get hurt in, in Russia. Do you see? I mean, do you see? Uh, there is a. a a theme which many people have explored, which is a lack of Western leadership and lack of coherence on a whole whole range of things. Do you, I mean, do you see that? I think that's right, and I think that we're seeing also a reaction to the withdrawal of America from international affairs on the same scale that we used to experience in the world. I think Putin saw that, and I think that he saw in the reaction to the Ukraine situation that Europe didn't also have a unified foreign policy by any stretch of the imagination. But I think what's more important is when we take a wider view of this, we should pull out and see that this isn't just about Vladimir Putin, uh, much as that is a big part of the problem, that also we can see that uh, even in Donetsk, there's a, a sizable Russian ethnic or Russian speaking population, and that there are some genuine uh, urges there for some sense or level of autonomy. I mean, I remember during the 2012 uh, Euro 
European uh, football championships hosted there that you would go to Donetsk and there would be huge portions of the population cheering on Russia. And I think that that's part of the problem is by making this a black and white issue totally and by making it goodies and baddies, as is often the way that we tend to see things mm. covered today's news, we're ignoring quite a real problem there. I think yeah. it's very easy to think that because people speak Russian, they want to be part of Russia. That's not true. Let's not remember in Crimea, which people seem to have accepted uh, the annexation. Actually, the party that stood for Russian unity got 4% of the vote at the election. There is this huge difference between people wanting to be part to sympathy and supportive of Russia culture and, and Russia people and all the family ties there and actually wanting to join Russia and wanting to leave Ukraine and, and also wanting to abandon the sort of modern democratic European ideal. Uh, in favour of the authoritarian regime of, of Putin. Well, let's move on, because in the Dateline London weekly search for something to cheer us all up, it was clearly not going to be the Ebola outbreak in West Africa or the mess of the Argentine economy. So we settled on the idea that driverless cars could be in our future. Is that something which does cheer up our distinguished panel? Or, like me, do they feel there's something slightly weird about moving around with no one in control? Would it, uh, driverless cars, we are told, that could be in all our futures. Google's already got one that, that works, apparently. Yeah, I think it's, it, it's similar to, I think, the way we were all very uncomfortable at one point long ago putting our credit card details online to buy things. I think we'll, we'll slowly get used to it. Um, but I think it does raise a lot of really interesting issues about, um, you know, uh, you know, these cars are going to be powered largely by, you know, in part by the internet, right? So what if the internet breaks down? <laughs> uh, and there's the whole question of who's liable in an accident. Um, is it the car company? Yeah, we could blame you? somebody else. Is it the internet service <laughs> yeah. provider? Um, and then you had the FBI, I think, warning that um, driverless cars uh, represent a threat because of the possibility of hack attacks and uh, driverless cars being used as getaway vehicles and you know. <laughs> um, so you know yes. it, we could take this slightly too far couldn't we i was worried about what do you do about the cat in the road will your driverless car be a cat lover and swerve and run into something else i mean i, I don't know <laughs> are, are you are you terrified about this problem no i think it's brilliant i'm all in favor i think most crashes are caused by human error i think it's very good in an aging society and personally i like the idea of being able to read a book or read a paper or whatever well you could text legally on the text car, legally right? while being transported. I think it's all great. And uh, it should, I think it'll be driven actually by insurers uh, wanting people to take driverless cars because, what is it, so many people are killed on the roads anyway. This, this is only an advance. And I think, as ever, there's a Luddite fear of it, which I understand. <laughs> and we're so used to sitting there concentrating that to be sitting there sort of looking around will be a bit strange. <laughs> Driverless cars. We haven't solved the Middle East crisis, and we're a long way off that. But can we solve the problems of our road safety? I think that driverless cars is a great idea. I mean, if we look at the history, we'll see that people were probably once scared of a carriage without a horse at the front of it. And this well, didn't they walk up, walk around the in front of a thing. car with a with a flag? Right, but now we won't need to. We won't have human error involved. And in fact, I think this will see the end of personal car ownership and even taxis, as we'll end up with a network of autonomous cars that we can hail on our smartphones, and they will come and pick us up, drop us off, and then go to. Where where they're needed most next. So I think it's obviously the future, but it's going to put a lot of people out of work and admittedly scare a lot of people because they're not used to sitting yeah. in a machine moving but itself. If you, are, if, yeah. if you are a young family, so you can let your children go by car to school and come back by programming it, right? right. So this is great help for young families. <laughs> but in my age... Certainly. You don't have to listen to, are we there yet? <laughs> exactly. Uh, exactly. Now, in my age, I would, li I would like the idea because, you know, it will help me continue driving. But at the same time, as you know, we come here by cars and drive us, drive us here to the studio. And I'm going to miss <laughs> my driver, Anna, the lovely lady. So if this is applied to the, to, the, uh, uh, to the industry and if you get this service driverless, I'll, I'll greatly well, miss her. Really. It would destroy a great deal of British journalism, wouldn't it? There wouldn't be any taxi drivers to talk to when you go abroad. <laughs> well, that's you true, know what's going on. You yeah. wouldn't you find anything. Well, you go online, of course, because oh, you'd be online in the online. car. Oh, I and see. And it might help because people can read newspapers and uh, watch television news and things when they're in the car. Well, I think I I've, I've <laughs> might still be the slightly Luddite tendency. I remember getting in the Docklands Light Railroad for the first time and finding out there wasn't anybody driving and thinking, I'm on a train and nobody's driving. When, <laughs> when they introduced trains, people said that you could, the human body couldn't withstand going at more than 30 or 40 miles an hour. But you right. see, if you introduce this car, <coughs> these cars, you'll be, you know, then you have to transform lifestyle everywhere. You have to transform industry, uh, uh, transport, every, everything. But right. you, here you are talking about maybe 50 years long 
project. Right, we should live so long to see it. Well, thank you all very much. That's it for Dateline London for this week. We'll be looking for some more good cheer in the gloom at the same time next week and hope you'll join us. Until then, you can, of course, comment on the programme on Twitter at Gavin Esler. Thank you for watching and goodbye. Thank you.